This is the 12th episode in a 30-part series giving an ecological overview of the insect orders. This episode will be looking at termites from the order Isoptera, a fascinating and somehow understudied order of eusocial specialist detritivores. Technically, these insects are genetically similar to cockroaches, so much so that they are considered a suborder, meaning they actually belong within the order Blatodea, which contains cockroaches, and subsequently termites. However, these insects are so behaviorally and morphologically distinct, I decided to make them into their own video. But understand, this could also be considered a part two to the Blatodea episode. The name Isoptera comes from the Greek roots isos, meaning equal, and terra, meaning wing. So, Isoptera literally means equal wings, referring to the fact that termites have two pairs of wings that are of equal size and shape, unlike many other winged insects where the forewings and hind wings differ. That being said, termites don't keep their wings for most of their life, instead opting to use them simply for reproductive purposes. Termites are fascinating in that they have an incredibly low amount of biodiversity when measured against the total amount of biomass that the entire order takes up. Even compared against specifically the eusocial Hymenoptera, which is the order that contains ants, bees, and wasps, termite species are, on average, about 4.6 times more massive in terms of global biomass than each eusocial Hymenoptera species, meaning that in purely technical terms, the termite is likely the animal with the lowest amount of biodiversity per unit of biomass among all terrestrial animals. This is true, and yet they practically don't exist within colder climates. So how can this be? How can such an impactful and important insect have such a lack of biodiversity? Well, what this implies is that the termite has a narrow but intensely winning strategy that wins despite a lack of biodiversity. But this is still strange because a lack of biodiversity creates the following problems. Number one, a lower resilience to change. Number two, narrower ecological functions. Number three, reduced adaptive potential. And number four, inbreeding and genetic bottlenecks. So basically, if their DNA is unresistant to change, and thus they are more vulnerable to pests and diseases. And lastly, if their niche becomes unsustainable even a little bit, they probably would not last. So, how do termites mitigate this? How do they survive with such low biodiversity? Well, it's quite an interesting story, so let's start at the beginning. Termites, as we've said before, evolved from cockroaches. But unlike cockroaches, Termites are very specialized in diet, and they don't like to move away from home. Only the reproductives will leave home to start up colonies on their own. However, similarly to cockroaches, the gut bacteria of these insects is far more capable and complex than that of your average bug. Cockroaches possess a very strong gut biome, so that they're able to digest just about anything they consume. But the big secret of termites is that they've adapted this strong microbiome to very specific, unobtainable food resources so that they can have a monopoly on said resources because other insects are unable to digest it. They basically refined the cockroach's ability to eat anything to being able to eat one thing that most other animals don't have the stomach for. Here's a list of these things that they have adapted to eat almost exclusively that other insects can't eat to the same degree. Some termites also cultivate fungus gardens like leafcutter ants, and others are somewhat 
opportunistic like ants as well. But the gross majority of termites make their living by getting the most nutrition out of things other insects cannot digest. They, similarly to cockroaches, will eat the feces of their parents or use trophallaxis in order to acquire the necessary gut symbionts they need to consume said matter. In this way, they are obligate to one another, which is one of the prerequisites for how they evolved to be eusocial insects, in that without the help and spread of the necessary symbionts, these insects could not have survived and thus needed to be social to capitalize on their niche and survive together. Now, this life strategy answers two things with regards to their low biodiversity, those being that termites are resistant to change and possess strong niche stability because what they eat is abundant and has been for millions of years and often undigestible to anything other than termites. However, it does not yet answer the question, how are termites not devastated by pest and disease despite living in such close quarters and having such low biodiversity? Indeed, this is a problem for agriculturalists of both plants and animals. The banana industry is in perpetual chaos for this very reason. Low genetic diversity and biodiversity. Well, the answer is that termites gut microbiome more than makes up for their low biodiversity. While the variety found in termite DNA across species is quite low, the variety of species found in their gut is often higher than that of the surrounding soil. Indeed, there is an entire empire of bacteria that have been evolving codependently with termites for millions of years, protecting these animals from hostile invaders so that they have a place to call home. In response, the termites don't change all that much because they have to evolve slowly and with their microbiomes, in that every mutation or refinement of their DNA through natural selection has to an account for the entire ecosystem inside of their bodies. Termites still evolve into many different niches and species, but there is still an incredible lack of biodiversity, likely due to an evolutionary lag of codependent evolution with the microbiome. This is all for the purpose of having exclusive success to exclusive resources. The eusociality, which is colony forming behavior found within termites is different from the eusociality found within ants, bees, and wasps. I explained haplodiploidy in the video above, which is one of the factors Hymenoptera use to effectively allocate tasks among their castes, allowing for far more differentiation among individuals in a colony due to more varied selective pressures being placed upon those individuals. Termites do not possess this, and so their caste determination is more traditional, so to speak, and more based on pheromonal cues and life stage, with no individual being 100% locked into any role straight from birth. What this means is that just about any old termite could become a reproductive queen or king under the right circumstances, whereas in ants, bees, and wasps, this is not the case, and some females are born sterile, and others are born to be queens. In termites, the caste differentiation process is influenced by environmental cues and chemical signals, mainly through hormones. The young, or nymphs, when exposed to specific hormones or pheromones, will develop into either workers, soldiers, or reproductive individuals. For example, if the colony is under stress, or there is a lack of workers, some workers may develop into new reproductive individuals to ensure the survival of the colony. Some species can even develop into reproductives in the worker or soldier stage, allowing for continued success at the sudden loss of a king or queen. Ants, bees, and wasps don't actually possess a king because their eusociality is structured differently. But in termites, the king will stay near the bloated queen and mate with her multiple times throughout her life. 
They'll mate for life until the king dies and is replaced by a new king. The queens of termites do it in this way because they live so long and require fresh sperm throughout their lives to maintain reproductive success. This is different in ants, bees, and wasps, who can collect and store all the sperm they need for their entire life in a one-time mating event right after they leave the nest. This is evident in the fact that in some species, termite queens can live a staggering 21 years. Some ant queens can live up to about 30 years. Many articles online say that termites can live up to 50 years, but I could not find a peer-reviewed source that confirms this, so I affirm it's only about up to 21 years. When it comes to nest building, it's fairly safe to say that termites have ants beat. In addition to some amazing features exclusive to termites, such as climate control and underground tunnels that stretch more than 100 meters underground, some can stand up to 30 feet tall. What this means is that it's possible that full-grown giraffes can and do encounter termite mounds almost double their height. Some mounds in Australia even use the Earth's magnetic field to sense which way the colony is facing so that they can build it facing north to south. They do this so that they are facing away from the sun at midday when it's the hottest, thus mitigating excessive heat. And then, at the time of day in which it's the coolest, the mound will be facing towards the sun. The majority of termite species are found in tropical and subtropical climates, like parts of Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central and South America, and Northern Australia. These areas have the right amount of warmth and moisture for termites to thrive. Termites struggle far more than ants do with cold temperatures because the upkeep of their gut microbiome is made even more difficult by the cold. And so, although some are somewhat adapted to surviving the winter, it's usually through very specific circumstances that are not conducive to the entire species surviving in the northern hemisphere. Here's a quick list of termite habitats. The morphology of the termite is fairly straightforward beyond their caste system. There are variations with regards to head shape, mandibles, and even eyes across workers, soldiers, and reproductives. But overall, their body plan is quite simple, designed to be adaptable for the many tasks that termites perform. There's almost zero specialization in their abdomen across all species because they have an obligate specialization to containing the microbiome. And in addition, if the nymph becomes a reproductive, any variation from a standard abdomen would make growing to a massive size impossible. Indeed, the queens can reach up to 10 to 30 times larger than the workers in body weight and it usually takes several weeks to a few months after she's mated and started laying eggs for her to reach this size. Now let's discuss some eusocial dynamics with regards to termites. In a previous video, I discussed how termites became eusocial. So here I will just briefly explain certain key factors that assist in termite survival. Number one, if the queen or king dies, some colonies can raise neonic reproductives from the worker or nymph casts, kind of like emergency backups, which can recycle the colony into the next generation, allowing some colonies to survive for decades. Number two, if the queen and king are still alive, the reproductives will still pair up and reproduce, but do so in swarming season, where they will grow wings, pair off, mate, and fly away to start their own colony. Here they will shed their wings much like ants, only ants wings are quite different and they don't keep the males around after mating. Number three, termite colonies are epigenetically programmed much like bees, ants, and wasps, but they rely far more on pheromonal and environmental cues 
to decide what life stage they'll become and what tasks they'll perform. They use trail pheromones, warning pheromones, and even the king and queen utilize inhibitory pheromones on the workers and soldiers to prevent them from developing into reproductives before their time, which has much to do with succession. Number four, morphologically, despite ants, bees, and wasps having more casts and roles to perform much of the time, termites can still become quite exaggerated in their tasks despite their plasticity. Some termites act as suicide bombers, covering enemies in a sticky substance that erupts from their thorax to slow down predators. A fascinating thing to think about when considering that a soldier could have just as easily become a massive queen, who in some cases can lay up to 30,000 eggs a day. Ants don't exhibit such plasticity, but in return, they have more variety in the casts themselves. Termite casts, but not always, can be more exaggerated. However, there are fewer of them, usually only about three. Termite relationships with humans are complicated. On one hand, they're infamous for chewing through wooden structures, causing billions of dollars in property damage each year. In North America, it's actually an invasive species that has caused most of this damage. Their hidden colony-based tunneling makes them hard to detect and even harder to evict, in that you can have termites and not even know it because they have no problem working in the dark. This can cause wooden furniture to collapse, and even entire buildings. On the other hand, termites play a crucial role in many ecosystems by breaking down tough plant material like cellulose helping recycle nutrients into the soil. So, despite causing problems, they are essential to the cleanup of forest floors and other ecosystems, eating the things that nothing else will. So, why are termites uniquely successful? Well, I would put forth the following reasons. Termites can eat the most difficult to digest, but plentiful food resources. And like cockroaches and mantises, they have been adapting towards this niche for an extremely long time, longer than even ants, bees, and wasps. Indeed, they were the first insects and perhaps first animals on earth to develop eusociality. That is colony forming behavior that satisfies these three criteria. These insects are the optimal cleanup crew who utilize the most effective resource exploitation strategy, that is eusociality for the most abundant and exclusive resources. The gut microbiome they possess to accomplish this, however, has likely limited their adaptive potential. But it's obviously an incredibly stable niche as they still survive despite their low biodiversity have the second highest biomass of any terrestrial arthropod group, aside from eusocial ants, bees, and wasps, which succeed not because they can eat more, but because they can exploit more with a wider range of tasks. But the Hymenoptera belongs in a future episode. Thanks for watching this episode of Privileged Bug Facts. Stay tuned for more content just like this. Thanks.